that's uh, it's a it's a very simple message to me. Some people tell me I make things too simple. I don't know. I I think it is simple. You know, Yeshua never spoke in more than three syllables. Um, he didn't speak intellectually. He didn't sit around and study all the time. Uh, he didn't memorize scripture. Uh, he lived the scripture. He didn't practice what he preached. He preached what he practiced. I think it's good to preach what you practice. Um, so just to give some context, you're, you know, we're coming up on Passover. Um, I'm looking forward to it. I do love the holidays. And uh, all my four kids will be with Bernadette and I. And, um, man, I love them so much. And I'm, we're just going to have a great Passover. Um, in the book of Exodus, obviously, we saw Israel delivered from Egypt. And they were set apart. They were, like, taken. And they were set apart. And God said, you're mine. You're my special possession. You're my treasured possession. You're my segalot. Segalot is a very powerful word. <coughs> in the Hebrew language. We read a little bit of Hebrew because we want to keep reminding people that Yeshua didn't speak English. And there's always going to be somebody, let me stop you right now, some knucklehead, I'm sorry, some theologian who's going to call me and say, well, he actually didn't speak Hebrew. He spoke Aramaic. Aramaic is like American, and Hebrew is like English. It's the same thing. Stop it. Stop arguing and witness. Nobody called you to be a judge. God called you to be a witness. Nobody called you to be an attorney. God called you to be a witness. So I saved you a phone call, then I. Uh, say hello to beautiful. It's like your favorite thing. If you had one favorite thing, that's your segalot. Then we come upon Leviticus, the next book, and we think about laws, Leviticus, Levites, and we see how Israel was to be separated. She was called to be separated from sin and uncleanness in order to approach God in his sanctuary because God is holy. You've got a holy God. The Bible covers, used to say holy Bible. Yes. And we're supposed to be holy people. We're supposed to be. Yes. Holiness for the children of Israel becomes the rule of the camp. And if you read both the Old Testament and the New Testament, you'll see where God demands that his people be holy. And why? He says, because, because I am. You want to be my people, then I'm holy, and I want you to be holy. I want you to be distinguished. I want you to be set apart. I'm going to share a couple of things with you that I'm not, I'm not sure that you've seen. Maybe you have seen, but I like to, you know, share some things that maybe weren't so easily seen sometimes when we read the Scripture. Chapters 11 through 15, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, five chapters in Leviticus deal with matters of ceremonial. It's a big difference. Ceremonial cleanness and uncleanness. Those who became defiled were ritually unfit until they were cleansed. A holy people must be holy in every area of life. In your marriage, in the movies you watch, the books you read, God even used food. Now, guys, some people tell me, oh, I don't really care about food because they want to sound, you know, religious. Everybody cares about food. Everybody likes to eat. I've been to 50 countries. I've been all over the world. I've been to some of the poorest places, and they still, Samuel writes me, he says, Rabbi, you know, you, you sent this money, and we bought these people good food, basmati rice. They can't eat basmati rice. They can't afford it. 
Everybody likes to eat. I mean, you all do. And food is a mainstay. It's part of every culture. We enjoy getting together for dinners and, and going out and eating with our friends and barbecuing at games and all that stuff. It's, it's part of who we are. And so God uses something that's so part and parcel of us, something we love so much, something that we do three, four, five times a day, maybe more. I mean, we're constantly eating. We're constantly nibbling, right? So he uses food to illustrate the difference between clean and unclean. It's not about the food itself. It's about what it represents. If we take a look at our Torah Pasha, we'll see just that. We'll look at what Kerry read so well. Such then, reading from Leviticus 11, 46, 47. Such then is the law concerning animals, flying creatures, all living creatures that move about in the water, and all creatures that swarm on the ground. Its purpose. So what's the purpose? To distinguish between unclean and the clean and between the creatures that may be eaten and those that may not be eaten. So if you look up these words, I'm sure you could figure it out just by looking at the words, but anyway, let's look at them. First word, unclean, is tameh. This is a word that's very well known in Jewish circles. It means impure, but God's using it in an ethical sense, a religious sense. He's talking about ethical impurity and religious impurity not the food itself. He made all the animals. So it's like, oh, I've got to stay away from that. That's impure. It's talking, he's using it to teach about, eth he's about ethical, not ceremonial. You could, you could be praying with your heart bowed and your heart could be proud. It's not about the posture of your body. It's the posture of your heart. Clean, tahor, means pure or clean morally. It's figurative language. And then, of course, distinguish is to divide or to separate. And it actually means the connotation or the inherent meaning is to withdraw from. Like, I can't. I can't. So in giving this law concerning clean and unclean creatures, God was teaching lessons about his holiness and the necessity for his people to be holy as well. In other words, there were things that God considers clean or good and things that God considers unclean and bad. It's just that simple. Remember somebody wrote a book, Things That God Loves and Things That God Hates? It's just that simple. There are things that God loves that you'll draw his spirit out of him, you'll pull it right out of him, and things that you'll retract it and push it away. This is what I find incredibly interesting. Kind of a boring guy, I guess. Chapters 11 through 15, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 Leviticus deal with matters of ceremonial cleanness and uncleanness. So God is demanding in those chapters his people to be holy because he is holy. But to me, this poses a very, very serious problem. You know what the problem is? Man by nature and by practice is unholy. Yes. Yes. No matter how hard you try, there's a shortfall. Right? So we have these five chapters that talk about being holy. And how does God remedy this problem? He gives the solution in the very next chapter. Chapter 16 of Leviticus is 34 verses called the Day of Atonement. Now, the Day of Atonement is in Leviticus 23, right? As one of the seven feasts of the Lord. Why is it listed in Leviticus 16 then? And how come none of the others are listed in Leviticus 16 or 17 or 18? Why did he need to talk about the Day of Atonement when he's just a couple of chapters later going to talk about it? There's smoke coming out of your ears. <laughs> Didn't you ever ask yourself, what is, it, what is it doing here? And the detail of it is crazy. The greatest day on the Jewish calendar was the Day of Atonement. 
You're familiar with it, I know, especially if you've been here for any length of time. When the high priest, the one high priest, the Kohen Haggadol, would go into the most holy place, past the outer courtyard, past the holy place, into the very presence of God, and he would come in there with sacrificial blood to make atonement for himself and for his people. They tried to be holy, and I think you should try. I don't think you shouldn't try. But you're going to fall short. But keep trying. So, although the Day of Atonement is listed with the feast in Leviticus 23, it shows up here. And then Leviticus 17, the very next chapter, talks about laws concerning clean sacrificial animals, what animals could be used for sacrifice. And the key verse is in 11. Let's get a little context. Look at 17, Leviticus 10 through 11. It says, when someone from the community of Israel or one of the foreigners, does not say if, it says when, doesn't say if, living with you eats any kind of blood, I will set myself against that person who eats blood and cuts him off from the people. And then you say, who's eating blood? I hung out with the Maasai tribe in Kenya. They drink blood all the time. They offered it to me, and I explained why I can't. And that led me to share about my God. For the life of a creature is in the blood. And I have given it to you. God says, I've given you the blood to make atonement for yourselves, for it is the blood that makes atonement. Not your holiness that makes atonement. Because if you're going to present your holiness to God for atonement, you also got to present your own holiness, and that's going to abrogate your atonement. The eating of blood was forbidden. It was for atonement, not nourishment. The principle behind it is life for life. Since the wages of sin is death, right? Symbolized by the shedding of blood. So without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. This is basic God 101. Forgiveness does not come because the penalty is excused. God doesn't say, ah, let's just forget about it. No, sin is never just forgotten about. Not in God's domain, not in God's economy. Forgiveness comes because it is transferred to a sacrifice whose lifeblood is poured out. The poor, innocent animal gets his neck slit because of what we do. Somebody's got to pay. That's the system of justice, right? We see so much injustice. We're like, this is crazy. The victim becomes victimized. What's going on today? This can't be happening. It is happening, and it's going to get worse. Sorry. But God's a God of justice. Justice and righteousness is the foundation of his throne. Somebody's got to pay. Sin is really bad. It screws people up. There's some people in here that are screwed up for the rest of their life because of what was done to them perpetrate against them because of sin. Sin is incredibly destructive and toxic. And so God says, somebody's got to pay. So he creates this zobach, an innocent victim who pays for the sins of others. That's basic Torah, man. That's basic Judaism. No remission of sin without it. That's God's way of doing things. Fast forward to the New Testament, Matthew 26, 26 to 28. It says, while they were eating Passover, they're celebrating Passover. Why is Yeshua celebrating Passover? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he was just being obedient to Leviticus 23, and if he wasn't obedient, he'd be a sinner and we wouldn't be saved, so it's a big deal. Should we be celebrating Passover? I don't know. Figure it out. Figure it out. 
Some people won't go out to eat on Shabbat. You know, it's not a proper. They, they said, well, what, what should I do, Rabbi? I said, figure it out. Talk to God. They're working anyway. I don't go out to eat on Shabbat because I'm exhausted. But if I do go, they're going to get a crazy sick tip. So I'm going as a blessing. Shabbat was made for me. I wasn't made for it. I don't worship Shabbat. I worship the Lord of the Sabbath. Doesn't mean I disrespect Shabbat. It's a holiday. But we'll, let's continue and we'll get to a point, I promise. Yeshua took a piece of the matzah. Now, in most of your Bibles, it says bread. That's a mistake right there. Wouldn't serve bread on Passover. It's totally erroneous. It's just a way to de Judaize the scriptures. I used to speak at so many churches. I must have spoken at 100 churches, and they always have that painting of the Last Supper. And I just find it, I, I always looked at like, first of all, it's like 12 blonde guys with blue eyes around the table. There's no Israeli that had blonde hair or blue eyes, not light skin, dark skin like mine. And then Yeshua's got a big loaf of bread in front of him. He says, don't eat any bread with leaven. He's breaking the law right there in the picture. We've got a Messiah who's a sinner. I was like, where did they get this picture from? It's the gospel according to Jesus Christ, not Leonardo da Vinci. Well, what's the big deal? Because Satan is very good at what he does. And he wanted desperately to de-Judaize the faith. And once the Jews and the Gentiles came together through Messiah, he totally couldn't separate them. And that's what we have today. You guys Saturday, you guys Sunday. You guys the Levitical feast, you guys Christmas and Easter. You guys brisket, you guys pork loin. And there's the separation, right? He builds the wall. He took a cup of wine and made the bracha. Bracha todanoil hanu melchlam borei prihagaf. It's been around for a very long time. And he gave it to them. And he said, all of you drink from it. Mandatory. Command. Drink from it. Exclamation point. Drink from it. For this is representative of my blood, which ratifies the new covenant. My blood shed on behalf of many so that they may have their sins forgiven. I'm sure they didn't know what the heck he was talking about. Not even close. They're probably like, I don't know what that means, but nobody wanted to say anything. They didn't want to look dumb. They go, oh, okay. Blood of new covenant. You know? Yeshua uses the Passover. This is rich, figurative, figurative language. Figurative. He wasn't giving them actually his blood. It wasn't literal. And he was teaching about how this new covenant is going to be ratified. His precious blood was going to be shed for the forgiveness of sins. No other way, man. No other way. His blood was sufficient to provide forgiveness for all. But here it was shed for many, but it would only be effective in removing the sins of those who believe. It's not universal salvation. It's open for everybody, but you've got to embrace and be immersed in the. The principle is taught all throughout the New Testament. It's not just right here. This is just the beginning of it. Look at three giants in the faith, Paul, Peter, and John. Giants, right? Paul, Peter, and John, right? Giants. All right. Paul said it this way in Romans 3.25. God put Yeshua forward as the Kippur, Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur. For sin, through his faithfulness, in respect to his bloody sacrificial death. Some people say there must have been another way, no? God said, absolutely not. There is no other way. The prophet Isaiah prophesied and said, God would be pleased to crush his son. That sounds because if he does, he would see his offspring. You know how that is? Everybody sitting in the sanctuary. Peter said it this way, 1 Peter 1, 18, 19. You should be aware that the ransom, you were ransomed. Satan had you in his grip. You were ransomed. It was paid to free you 
from the worthless way of life. Worthless. Just taking care of you and doing for you and just living this selfish, self-centered, me, 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 me. You know, that's what's wrong with the world today. The motto is, I don't give a crap. That's the motto today. And most people are taking an overdose of vitamin I. The worthless way of life, which your fathers, they were worthless. They passed it on to you. But it didn't consist of anything perishable like silver or gold. On the contrary, it was the costly, bloody, sacrificial death of the son. Rabbi, I don't get it. What can I tell you? Hopefully you will. I just don't get it, Rabbi. I just don't get it. Why can't I just be a good person? Because you can't. Because you're not. You're a selfish son of a gun. Who doesn't like his schedule interrupted. Wants to do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, to whom he wants, whenever he wants. You sound like God. A lamb without defect. If anybody didn't deserve it, it was Yeshua. And John says it this way in 1 John 1, 7. But if we are walking in the light, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of his son Yeshua purifies us from all sin. Now, with that being said, we'll move on to our New Testament reading. I don't pick these scriptures, by the way. If you're new, I don't pick them. Somebody picks them for me. They take the whole portion and they pick a couple of verses because people can only read a couple of verses. And then they try to pick a New Testament portion that coincides with it. They, they do a great job, a great job. We're going to be in the book of Acts. Just as an overview, in the first seven chapters of Acts, chapters 1 through 7, we see the Messianic congregation in Jerusalem growing as the gospel spreads through the whole city. Spreads through the whole city. Then in chapters 8 and 9, the gospel starts to move beyond the city of Jerusalem into the regions of Judea and Samaria. Then we see the gospel going beyond the nation of Israel to the very ends of the earth as it still does today. Or what the book of Revelation calls every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language. Um, I'm sorry. I need to, I always forget to drink water now because for like two months I was on this fluid restriction where you can only drink like 30 ounces of water a day, which was nuts. And many days I couldn't have water at all, so I keep thinking I'm still on that restriction. But I'm not, so. L'chaim. I want to point out something that, that maybe you, you've seen. If you have, you know, it's not terrible to see again, but I, I don't know, man. I never saw this. In the book of Acts, chapters 8, 9, and 10, check this out, 8, 9, and 10, we have a conversion of a descendant of one of Noah's sons. Noah had three sons, right? And this, their three sons populated the world, Right? Europe, Africa, Asia, and it expanded. You know, the Americas weren't populated, but through them they were. You follow? These are the three where everybody came from. So watch this. In Acts 8, you have the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, Ethiopia. So that's undoubtedly the line of Ham. Good? Saul of Tarsus is in chapter 9, and he was a descendant of Shem, the Shemites. Right? And here in our New Testament reading, we have Cornelius in chapter 10, a descendant of Jebeth. That's cool, but some of you won't admit it because you're a know it all, right? <laughs> you're a know it all. You're like, I knew that. You didn't know that, but then you're going to tell somebody later, right? Hey, I saw this cool thing in the scriptures. No, you didn't. Stop plagiarizing. Guys, it's important. It's not just some information. This is a striking witness 
to the fact that the gospel is for all races and all cultures and that in Messiah Yeshua all these natural distinctions are abolished. Peter used the keys of the kingdom in opening the door of faith to the Jews in Acts chapter 2. And in our New Testament portion, we're going to see him opening up the key, opening up the kingdom to the Gentiles. Some Gentiles should say hallelujah. hallelujah. The Jews didn't save you. You were grafted into the kingdom of heaven through the blood of Yeshua. You could be very grafted into Israel and still be incredibly lost. I have plenty of natural born Israeli friends that are lost. I, I, I've watched this now for, for years. I've watched Jewish people get saved and they just become so enthralled with Yeshua. They're so happy that they met their Messiah. I'm one of them. They love him with all their heart. They worship him. And then I watch Christians come into the movement and go into a phone booth and come out like super Jew. <laughs> and all of a sudden they identify. They identify as Jewish for some reason. They tell Jewish people I'm Jewish because I'm Griffin. You're not Jewish, no more than I'm black. Even though I am darker than some black people, aren't I? Let's be honest. And then it gets crazy. And then you got a whole group of people that say, ah, it doesn't matter what you eat. And then you got people worshiping the dietary laws. Right, but what, do you think you know so much? No, I think that I've spent 35 years of my life every day contemplating and meditating on this. I don't have a secular job. Uh, I never paid attention to my kids. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding about that. But this is what I do every day, all day. I keep on trying to find that sweet spot. I keep on trying that fullness of grace and truth. I keep trying to find out who Yeshua was and what was important to him. And what is the kingdom of God all about? And try to create a place where if Yeshua touched down, he'd be like, I want to go there and worship. And if you do that every day for 35 years, then tell me your revelation. What I mean to say is I'm responsible to do that, right? I'm supposed to be teaching you. But if you know it all, why? You can't be taught. And if you're not teachable, you're useless. Thank you. Thank you. There was a time when Bruce Lee got pulled into Hollywood and he was teaching, you know, Elvis and all these big shots. And they would sit down with him and Bruce Lee would say, so tell me about yourself. And he was trapping them. They go, well, I have a black belt in Shotokan. Well, I studied three years in Japan under. And he said, I'd like you to leave. And they'd be like, why? I said, your cup's too full. If you don't empty your cup, I can't fill it. If you're too full, God can't fill you. And some of you are full, all right. Here's our New Testament reading. I'll put it in context, Acts 10, 9 through 16. Let's go. The next day, what's going on the next day? Cornelius, who was a God-fearing man, some people think he was a closet Jew, and um, he supported the synagogue and the temple. He heard a voice who told him to go send for Peter in Joppa. So next day noon, while they were still on their way, that was his, you know, he was a big shot. He was a centurion. Had 100 people under him. And so they're going to approach the city of Joppa. Kepha went up onto the roof of the house to pray. The roofs back then in the first century were flat. That's where a lot of people prayed. They got a little closer to God that way, and they got some solitude. Kepha goes up on the roof to pray. Just, you know, he, he prays, he prays, he prays. He's a praying man. He's a believer. And during this prayer, I don't know how long it was, but he felt hungry. Maybe he didn't eat any breakfast, and, you know, it's, it's, he wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing the meal downstairs, 
he fell into a trance. Now, you know how there's like Messiah's militia. They see trance and they go, oh, that can't be in the Bible. Trance is of the occult. You're of the occult. <laughs> he fell into a trance in which he saw heaven opened. Saw a vision. And something that looked like a large sheet being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it, in the sheet, were all kinds of four-footed animals, crawling creatures, and wild birds. Let us finish here. Then a voice came to him, get up, Kepha, slaughter and eat. Now this is seven years into his faith. So for seven years, he's still following the dietary laws, obviously, by his response. Kepha said, Peter said, no, sir, absolutely not. I have never eaten food that was unclean or trafe. Trafe means unkosher, according to the Bible, not rabbinical kosher. The voice spoke to him a second time. Stop treating as unclean what God has made clean. It's got to be more than food, guys. It can't be just about food. Because this happened three times. This is Peter, a bold and strong and incredibly spirit-filled believer who lived with Yeshua for three and a half years, was discipled directly from him. He was a witnessing machine, saw 3,000 come to faith in a two-minute sermon. And this, it happened three times, and he couldn't figure it out. If it was so simple, why is he struggling to figure it out? Okay, I guess I could eat unclean now. And why did it take seven years for God to tell him? So the Christian community go, oh, that's cool. I could suck the barbecue sauce right off my fingers. Peter, that's such a cool revelation. You think that's what it was about? I don't care what you eat personally. I really don't care. But do you think that's what it was about? The greatest thing in the history of the spiritual kingdom is coming to pass. The Abrahamic covenant is coming to pass. Right before Peter's very eyes. And you think it's about food? Now let's look at this word trance because I know somebody that went into a trance once in Israel. See, I never told people it's a trance because people would be like, oh, I knew it all along, he's of the devil. But then again, there were people that said Yeshua himself was full of Beelzebub. So religious people aren't always right. Ecstasy. What word in English do you think we get from this? Ecstasy. Yes, ecstasy. This, it's a long definition, but hear it. A throwing of the mind out of its normal state. An alienation of the mind. You're, you're out of your mind. That's why when people had a trance like that, they would be like, you're out of your mind. No, I know what I saw. Whether such as makes a lunatic or that of a man who by some sudden emotion, so either the person's a lunatic, right? You shoot and say he was a great teacher. He didn't say he was a holy man. He said he was the Messiah. He said he was part of the Godhead. Yes. So, call it for what you want, but call him a lunatic then. Or call him a liar. But don't say he was a great teacher. Way beyond that. By some sudden emotion is transported out of himself. So that in this rapt condition, in this euphoric condition... Although he is awake, not sleeping, it's not a dream, his mind is drawn off from all the surrounding objects and wholly fixed on things divine, yes. things of God, yes. that he sees nothing. He doesn't see this. He sees nothing but forms and images lying within him and thinks that he perceives with his eyes, his bodily eyes and his bodily ears, realities shown him by God. When I went into a trance, I thought I was there. I thought it was real. It was more real than real. God was showing me things divine. 
I had to meet the Messiah head on. I wasn't going to learn about him from a book or somebody sharing with me. I had to meet him. So in the trance, Peter sees a sheet descend like a huge talit. And inside the sheet were all types of four-footed animals, crawling creatures, wild birds, both clean and unclean. Peter declares that his record is clean when it came to the law of food. I've never. It's a no-brainer to see that it has deeper significance than just eating habits. The real significance of the vision, I believe, is this. And you're more than, listen, you could disagree with me. A lot of you do all the time. This is the significance to me. God was about to open up the door of faith to the Gentiles. Now, do we blame Peter? Do we say, Peter, uh, you are a racist. Boy, we throw that stupid word around every minute of the day. Yeah, I'm a racist. I, I hate racial idiots. The most important covenant made, the most important covenant made was the Abrahamic covenant. It was a covenant that didn't rely on anybody but God. He was going to do it no matter what Abraham did. It says, now Adonai says to Abraham, get yourself out of your country, away from your kinsmen, away from your father's house, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. Abraham, from you, from your loins, is going to come a nation of people. Abraham, Isaac, son of promise, Jacob, 12 tribes, Israel. Simple, right? That's irrefutable. That really happened. That's history. I'm going to make a great nation. I'm going to bless you. Did he bless Abraham? Yes. Wealth and riches was in his house. His name is great. In the world of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, Abraham's a big shot. You will be a blessing. I'm not blessing you to be blessed. I'm blessing you to be a conduit. You're not going to be a terminal of blessing. You're going to be a channel of blessing, which is the reason why we're blessed, by the way. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse anyone who curses you. This has happened all throughout history. And here's the kicker, the last piece of that third verse. And by you, by you, Abraham, by your loins, what's going to come from your posterity, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's what was happening with that sheet. And why didn't Peter talk to the Gentiles about faith? Because Jesus told them not to. What do you want from him? Did he not in the scriptures say, go the way of the lost sheep of the house of Israel, don't go the way of the Gentiles? That's exactly what he said. So he was just obeying. Look, the Gentiles were a pagan people. They did detestable things. Most of their sin was sexual. Just it was awful what they did with children. Males and males and females and females. It was detestable. They were cursed people according to the people of Israel. But look at what God's doing. Gentiles would be no longer looked as unclean aliens far from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now, and I repeat, but now, God was going to do a new thing. He's letting Peter know in Acts 10, I'm going to do a new thing. All I got to say is there's a lot of Gentiles in this room. Somebody should say hallelujah. Because if it was exclusively Jewish, you were dead in the water. 
Gentiles were represented in that sheet as the unclean beasts and the unclean birds. But they were going to receive the Holy Spirit just like the Jews did. Don't you see that's what we have here at Beth Yeshua? Don't you see that's what we worked for? If you want to know what Beth Yeshua is about, it's just about a few things. One, saving souls. I'm going to do that till my last breath. Two, discipling those saved souls. And three, doing works and acts of righteousness. Nothing more, nothing less. National and religious distinctions were to be dissolved. And all true believers in Messiah Yeshua would be on the same playing field. Isn't that good? Yes, now, a lot of people don't, don't see that. They think they're better than others because. Oh, Billy Graham, I know God used you to save thousands of souls, but you ate pork, so. I mean, look at me. I, I don't eat pork, and I don't celebrate the feast, and I haven't led somebody to the Lord in 10 years. Doesn't that impress you, God? What the heck are you here for? Shine your light. Evangelism has become as extinct in the Christian community as the dodo bird. We have millions of closet Christians. Get out of the closet. Everybody else has. They just have big mouths. And you guys are quiet little church mice. Rabbi, why are you saying that? It's hurting my feelings. I'm saying it, one, because it's true. And I have a feeling it hurts God's feelings. If you're not willing to talk to me about in front of people, guess what? Now, there's a way to do it, okay? Don't be a jerk. You got to legitimately care about the people. You got to legitimately love the people. They see through your bull crap. You got to love people. You got to care about people. You got to cry for souls. You got to do stuff with them and do stuff for them. Took me years. To, I just heard from a guy. I haven't heard from him in so many years. He could be watching. When I met this guy, he was a cop and he was a neo Nazi and he was anti Semitic. I should have just blew him off, right? He became the president of an international organization called Cops for Christ, and he's already adopted four kids and has three of his own. I'm just telling you, it takes time. It took time. My friend Brian, it took years. He was a Chippendale dancer. It took years. I had to deal with all his bull crap and listen to his stupid stories. Then he traveled the world as an evangelist. My friend Scott, he became a, a minister. He was a card-carrying atheist. Patsy was involved in the mafia. Now he feeds the homeless. You can't microwave somebody's faith. I gave you the book. I told you you could have it for free. I know there's people in your family that could read it and get something out of it. But I'm going to go study. I want to know who the Nephilim is. <laughs> Guys, come on, man. Come on. I can't be any real than this. Nobody's better than anybody else. Here, Nobody. That includes yours truly. We don't do selfish ambition here. We don't, we don't pat ourselves on the back. We don't compete with other believers on who's a better believer. We all fall short of the glory. So let me leave you with one verse. Ooh, it's getting late. The good thing is I don't have anything to do but baptize somebody. 
Tommy, how cold is that pool? Seriously, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> you know that, right? Um, if, if you're here for the first time, so you want to say hello, I'm going to hang out a while. And then I'll have to, hopefully, a little bit of sun. I'm waiting. I'm stalling. So <laughs> heat that pool up. Uh, let me leave you with one verse. Galatians 3.28 is gorgeous. There is neither Jew or Gentile. Neither slave nor free man. Neither male nor female. For in union with the Messiah, Yeshua, you are all one. What this is saying is in Yeshua, it doesn't matter about your ethnic identity. Stop it. Stop it. I'm a white Irish American believer. I'm a black, first of all, stop it. My roots might be Israel, but I'm American. Your roots might be African. You're American. You weren't born there. You don't know nothing about their culture. I know more about their culture than you do. Stop. Stop with the ethnic identity. Stop. Let the world have that. Not the body of Messiah. Let the world have that. Give it to them. Give it up. Your gender. Male or female. Not trans. If you were born male, you're male. If you were born female, you're female. For me, I know. I was born male. I was circumcised on the eighth day. Or your station in life. It doesn't matter. Rich, poor, intellect, uneducated, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to God. Why does it matter to you? A Jew is not preferred over a Gentile. Stop trying to be a Jew. A free man is not more favored than a slave. A man not more privileged than a woman. If they are in Messiah Yeshua, then they are all on the same level. That's what I love about the kingdom. Here's the great news. <coughs> if you are in Messiah Yeshua, big if, if you are in Messiah Yeshua, you are one of God's chosen people. He chose you. And you stand to inherit all that God promised. It is only, and I repeat, it is only through Yeshua that anyone can inherit God's kingdom. While there still may be ethnic and gender and social distinctions that carry weight in other contexts, those distinctions do not affect one's standing as a child of God by faith in Yeshua. In a world that is so incredibly divided like never before, that deserves a big, healthy, hearty hallelujah. Agreed? Let's stand together. You don't know what it's like, Rabbi. You don't know what my people went through. Oh, give me a break. You want, you want to compare notes with the Jewish people? Their history is persecution illustrated. You want to compare notes? And whether your line was persecuted, you're doing pretty good. Cut the crap. You're in the kingdom, man. Stop it. God doesn't like it. Personally, I don't like it. I don't like the separation. I can't stand the division. Really. I remember when I first got here, I was asked to do a funeral of a guy. And he was a great guy. Um, and his wife called me and I said, surely he went to church for a long time. I, I don't feel comfortable doing it. She goes, no, he, I know he would want 
you to do it. So I did it, and it was, I'm, I'm brand new. I dr I'm driving in the country. I'm thinking, surely somebody's going to kill me. <laughs> I mean, Macon was like a major metropolis compared to where I went. People like coming to church on their tractor. <laughs> and it was a primitive Baptist church. Anybody familiar? I thought someone was going to throw a spear at me. I heard primitive. I didn't know what that meant. That just means no music, no dancing, and incredibly boring. So I went there to do the funeral. And after the funeral, I wanted to, you know, hang out. They had a little fellowship hall. So the lady was serving beverages. And this is what she said to me. She said, my, my granddaddy told me how your people came through here and burned down the place. And I said, that's kind of weird because my granddaddy was in Germany when that was happening. So unless he had superpowers, I don't think he was involved in that. I said, madam, are you a Christian? She goes, absolutely. You know, that, that told a lot, right? She's housed by the spirit. I'm not sure which one, you know. I was going to, if I knew an exorcist, I would have, you know, gave her the number. And I said, you know, I'm Jewish. I'm Jewish. And, and you know, six million people, my people were killed. 1.5 million were children under 10. It's the worst Holocaust of all time. There's been others, but the worst. And I said, I drive a Volkswagen Jetta. And she goes, I don't understand what you're saying. I said, I don't hold it against Germans. I can't meet a German today and blame them. That's insanity. It's insanity. And where is it getting you? Except angry and miserable. You're angry at people that don't even know you're angry at them. And you've got this umbilical cord that you're feeding yourself with trash all day long. This is the kingdom, man. Different rules. If you don't want to play by these rules, then join another kingdom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Yes, I don't know who I put over Lecha. The assembly Shalom. May I tell you one more thing? The Holy Spirit just spoke to me right after I said that and said, You know, if it wasn't for me, somebody would have shot you a long time ago. <laughs> I, hand to God, I promise. Have a great day. <laughs>